Hello and welcome again to module two of our MOOC on language and emotion. Today we are interviewing Professor Lachlan Mackenzie from uh, VU University Amsterdam. He is Emeritus Professor at that university and uh, as many of you might know, he is uh, one of the forefathers of functional discourse grammar together with uh, Case Hengeveld. Uh, their main publication about this school of thought is their book uh, Functional Discourse Grammar, published by Oxford University Press in 2008. He is also a member of our group, Emo Fundet, and we are very proud of that. And uh, he is a member of the Cimitar Research Group based in Santiago de Compostela and the Selga Iltec in Coimbra, Port Portugal. Uh, among his latest publications are the book uh, entitled Pragmatics, Cognition, Context and Culture in co-authorship with uh, me <laughs> and the Grammar of English for Spanish Speakers entitled Compare and Contrast, co-written with Elena Martinez Caro from uh, uh, Complutense University here in Madrid uh, and who is also a member of Emma Fundet. Of course, he has numerous other publications, but today we're going to interview him, so I'm not going to talk so much about his, uh, uh, his uh, CV. So, uh, welcome uh, well, thank you. to the UNED and welcome to Spain, and thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to start with a question, since you are, a, you are an expert in functional discourse grammar, of course, because as I said, you are one of the forefathers of functional discourse mm -hmm. uh, grammar. So, uh, can you briefly explain uh, the main tenets of your approach uh, to the grammar of human language? Because you know, you know that this module is about grammar and emotion. And what makes this approach different uh, from other approaches? Well, Laura, thank you very much also for um, in inviting me to take part in this interview. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and uh, I'm going to have that pleasure again now. Uh, so, uh, functional discourse grammar uh, is conceived really as a basis for describing the structure of languages, but describing them as the result of use, of the fact that we use languages to communicate our knowledge and our feelings uh, to each other. And we focus in our grammar on what we call the discourse act, the, ba the basic unit of communication. We find it very clearly in speech, but it's also there sometimes in a more hidden form, in writing. And for each of these discourse acts, we provide four levels of description. We describe what we call the interpersonal level. That's to say, we describe how the language is used to interact between people, as we're doing now in right. this interview. Then we have what's called the representational level, which describes how grammar can be used to formulate and communicate ideas, or we call them more technically, propositions. Then we have a third level, which we call morphosyntactic, and it then deals with all the syntactic and morphological structures that language have, languages have. Some languages opt more strongly for syntax, others more for morphology, but our language theory is flexible enough to cover really all different kinds of language structure. And then finally, and certainly not the least important, is the phonological level. And this covers all the different aspects of the sound structure of utterances and includes, and this is going to be important, I think, for the study of emotion, it includes intonation, right. Right, the way in which we modulate the tone of our voice when we communicate. So, as I think I've been trying to say, the aim is to construct a grammatical theory that's applicable to all languages but which, above all, captures the fact that language structures are there to be used, to be used in interaction. And you asked me how it differs from other uh, right. approaches. Well, one obvious difference, perhaps, is that, as the name suggests, it takes a functional view. It looks at language as an instrument, as a tool. But at the same time, we differ from other functional approaches, insisting on the importance of a precise formalization. Right. Okay, so we 
uh, do present uh, um, formulae with lots of brackets and variables and sometimes rather mathematical looking uh, formulations in order to indicate quite precisely how each of these four levels that I was talking about are structured. But in spite, in spite of that, you also focus on discourse. It's not a very it's formal, yes. but at the same time you have discourse exactly. acts. Exactly. That's why we call it functional yeah. discourse yeah. grammar. And we're particularly um, interested in the way that discourse is composed of discrete discourse acts. Right. And then it's those discourse acts that we focus mm -hmm. on. So uh, then, because when dealing with uh, the expression of emotion, we are in the field of pragmatics. Yes. Then I wanted to ask you, how does pragmatics get into the picture of functional discourse? Well, grammar? that's a very good question. And it's one I hadn't really thought about enough <laughs> until I had the experience of writing that book together with you, yes. the book on pragmatics. The thing is that grammar tends to concentrate on how we encode our ideas yeah. and then how they are decoded by the hearer. And the idea would be that once you have decoded an utterance, then you know what the speaker had in mind. Well, pragmatic says, no, that's wrong. Pragmatic yeah. takes a very different idea. Pragmatic says that the speaker has a particular communicative intention and then conceives a kind of a strategy for mm -hmm. how to communicate that intention to the, the hearer. And that strategy involves all sorts of factors, the ones that we wrote about in our book. Right. Right? Things like implicatures, or indirectness, or politeness, or even impoliteness sometimes. Mm -hmm. So how the speaker actually formulates the intention is dependent really on all those other considerations. Right. Mm -hmm. And the hearer doesn't just decode the utterance like unpacking a Christmas present, right. but rather has to interpret the utterance in terms of what makes sense to him. And this uh, we would call creating a context in which the utterance makes sense. Now all of this does get a place in functional discourse grammar, but not in the grammar itself, which does concentrate, as most grammars do, on coding and decoding but in the other uh, modules that we have. Okay, so we have a, com a component that deals with conceptualization, another that deals with contextualization, and it's in the interaction between all those that um, pragmatics is situated in our model. Our model is not, of course, designed primarily to be about pragmatics. It's about grammar, but pragmatics has a strong influence, and. Um, and, and certainly once, now that I understand better, as a result of writing that book, what pragmatics is all about, I think that it will get a stronger position. Mm. I, I mentioned, if I can just mention it, the interpersonal level as the first yes. of the four. And I think this is where the effects of all those pragmatic considerations on grammar make themselves most strongly felt. This is where we look at the inner structure of discourse acts, the role of illocutions or, or speech acts, if you like, and also the way in which uh, a complete discourse act breaks down into what we call sub-acts, sub-acts of, of reference and sub-acts of predication. And then there are other kinds too, but those are the two main uh, sorts. And so, yes, I would say there is an interaction between the two, but we don't offer a theory of pragmatics, no, but, but it's, rather but it's but a, we are very much aware of what pragmatics... It's a variable there that you take into Absolutely. consideration That's that you, 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 you couldn't too. have a yes. grammar nowadays, I think, in the 21st century, which would not consider pragmatics. Well, by the, the way, there are such grammars, yeah, though. Yeah, there are. Yes. But, but by the way, I should explain to the general public that when we uh, speak of pragmatics in linguistics, mm -hmm. we are dealing with not only the linguistic component of a message, but also with the other variables that are interacting, that is to say the speaker, the listener, and the whole context, which will give the finally agreed meaning between interlocutors. Exactly. Precisely. Yeah. And so, and speaking about acts, because you deal with uh, discourse acts all the time, uh, how do you consider expressive acts? Uh, that is to say, how do you consider within your approach, the expressive function of language. Yes, the expressive function. Well, of course, I immediately think then of the great 
um, linguist of the 20th century, Roman Jakobsen, yes. all right? And yeah. he's famous for many things. And one of the things that he is famous for is identifying the six functions of language. One of the things that I do is edit the journal Functions of Language. Right. And that's so-called really in tribute to Roman Jakobsen's enormous contribution to the functionalist approach. So what are those six functions? Well, we have the referential function, if I already mentioned, referential subacts, yes. we have that. We have the poetic function, which concentrates on the uh, aesthetic uh, nature of, of language, the, the, what's called the conative function, right. the phatic function, the reflexive function, and then the one that you asked about, yeah, the expressive, expressive function. And in our view, and I think in Jakobsen's view too, the expressive function is the least communicative of all the functions. Because this, it involves primarily the speaker and only, if you like, by chance, a hearer. We talk about the expressive function, and Jakobsen did too, when a speaker um, utters something that reveals her internal emotional state. Right. Um, think, for example, of um, you, you're working in your garage, um, repairing um, some piece of furniture, and then you hit your thumb with the hammer and you scream, <laughs> ouch, like that. <laughs> right. Okay? Now, yeah. it could be that a hearer is present, right? Maybe your kid is playing in the corner or right. something like that. But you're not talking to the kid. You are um, just expressing your um, e emotion almost... It's almost close to an animal cry. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I, so the, the hearer may be present, but the exchange of ideas is not the speaker's goal with the expressive function. If I'm presented with some rotten food and I say, yuck, <laughs> right? That is just involuntarily expressing my disgust. You may then decide the best thing to do. You would may be, react. Yeah. You may react as a hearer and remove my food, but that's not the purpose of the expressive function. Now, in, in our grammar, in FDG, we have a category that we call expressives. And expressives have an illocution, that's the, the au or the yach or whatever. And it has, uh, obviously, there's a speaker. But when we represent formally the expressives, we don't have a hearer. And we also don't have any content. Right? There isn't a, 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 a cognitive message there. So, for instance, saying thank you is not an expressive in your grammar because this would be an expressive act for Searle, for instance. Yes, but not for Jakobsen and not for us. And uh, no, a thank you is definitely oriented to a hearer. I mean, the word yes. you is in there, thank you. But you're expressing gratitude. You're expressing gratitude, that's perfectly true, but um, it is, that is a cognitive thing. That's not something instinctive, uh -huh. right? The true expressives are... Um, but when I say they're like animal cries, they are different because they generally, with one or two small exceptions, obey the phonological rules of the, the language. language, right? Yeah. So, uh, but they, they differ from one language to another. In English, when I hit my thumb, I say ow or ouch. In French, you say aí. In Spanish, you say ai. Ai, okay. In, in Hungarian, you say yoi. Yeah. And... Um, they form even part of the vocabulary. In Hungarian, you can take yoi and add the suffix got, and that, that means yeah. to say ow repeatedly, okay? So that you can, you can actually apply the same morphological rules to these words, because they are words, um, as, uh, as other more normal uh, right. members of the lexicon. So right. that's our view of the ex expressives. Okay. I understand what you say about thank you. Uh, yeah. We um, call them... I think, communicatives, right? Because uh -huh. they are oriented to the hearer, even although they have no content. Right. right? They are an expression of emotion. Other example would be congratulations. Great, yeah, of course. Yes. Congratulations right. yeah. or everything that expresses your emotions in a way. In your but, but with respect yeah. to the other, yeah. you know, you're yeah. congratulating the other, you're thanking yeah. the other, but when you're saying ow or yuch yeah. or... Those are more like primitive. They're, they're more primitive, emotions, and they are, I'm yeah. sure. And, and even yeah. um, Darwin said this, right? Yes. That they're closer to animal, animal. Uh, cries. So yes. then you, you have already spoken a little bit about what I was going to ask you in my next question about interjections. Oh, interjections and how yes, yes. do you deal with interjections in your grammar? 
Right. Well, what is an interjection? Uh, I mean, if you think of the etymology, it means that uh, it has been thrown into the discourse, right? It, right. It, it, in a sense, they are a little bit outside the normal flow of discourse. And the definition of interjections varies, of course, from one theorist to another, yeah. and it covers certainly those expressives we've been talking about. It also covers hesitation markers like er uh and um that interrupt the flow, corrective markers, like it, you, you've said something and then you say, oops, that's not what I meant, oops, right? right? Or even some people say that words like hello or goodbye are interjections. So they're a bit of a mixed bag, and I think that as grammarians, what we like to classify, you know, as grammarians, yeah. you have to treat them with great discernment and caution. And I think that one good thing about our approach to, to grammar, I mentioned that it was more formalized than other uh, uh, functional approaches, is that you can pinpoint very precisely um, what the different subtypes are and uh, where the different interjections should be positioned within the system. So, I think to try and answer your question, I would say that certain interjections, certain, are emotive, expressive, and others aren't. And, um, you know, uh, the ones that we've been talking about will express very fundamental uh, emotions, no matter how you classify emotions like anger, disgust, fear, joy. Right. Right? They're, they're very, in a sense, primitive and, and direct, and they then typically get into uh, interjection form, whereas other more complex e emotions will need more uh, words to, to express them. Yeah. So then what would count as emotional categories within your view of language? Just interjections only, or would you have... Well... Um, How about someone saying, I love you, I like this, or this, is that... Um, well, yes, that's... Uh, my basic view is that the expression of emotion, the relationship between emotion and language is an indirect one, mm -hmm. okay? Um, the expression of emotions, the way I've formulated it, is, is, is parasitical upon the use of language to describe physical events. Mm -hmm. In English, we have this notion of a, 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 I think you gave the case of, I love you, right? Yeah. Um, in English, we have, and, and many languages do, but not all, the idea of a transitive predication, right? With mm -hmm. an actor, right. and an action, and, an object. and a patient, all right? So you've got something like, John hit the ball. Right. And they're presented also in that order in English, yeah. John hit the ball. And interestingly, when we come to talk about our feelings, we use exactly the same grammar, the, the same subject verb object grammar. For example, people fear snakes. I love you. Yeah. But notice that the, that the people here are not actors anymore. If you fear snakes, you're not doing anything, right? Mm -hmm. You are experiencing. You are uh, not active. But grammatically speaking, you're still the subject. Mm -hmm. right? You have the same analysis, or, or tree structure, if you like, for people fear snakes and John hit the ball. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it just seems that emotion language kind of copies ordinary language. And I think we, you can even turn it round. Uh, let's imagine that you start not from the people, but from the snakes. You get the same structure. Snakes frighten people. Yeah. Okay? So, languages also can differ in this way. In English, you can say, I like strawberries, right? In Spanish, you say, me gustan fresas. Las, las fresas. Okay? Yeah. Or las fresas. With the object verb subject order, but it's still the same idea. In Portuguese, yeah. it's, eu gosto de morangos. Oh, yeah. Okay? I like strawberries. The same verb. Uh, gustar in, in Portuguese, uh, uh, yeah. gust, uh, gustar in uh, Spanish. Yes. But the, it's the same verb and again subject verb order. So um, it, it, it is very um, curious that the language has not, and I don't think other languages have either, have not developed special grammatical structures for emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, another case, if I can, um, are, are like taboo words, right? I won't mention any on. Um, this program, but uh, <laughs> uh, 
the, the, like the, the F word in, in English, or the equivalent, this word is used to express powerful emotions. But in terms of its syntax, it just appears as a verb, a noun, an adjective. So it's, again, paras the, the parasitical upon ordinary grammatical categories. Right. And uh, oh. so I think that the emotional category is an interesting thing to study, but yeah. I wouldn't use language categories as the way in to, to studying emotions. Well, there are some studies about insubordination, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, yes. there's uh, uh, clauses that are supposed to, to work as uh, subordinate to a main clause, and then they're used in isolation, and yes. they say that they have this emotional content. They are yes. all used in that way. I don't know. And then also I was thinking that uh, uh, those examples are examples of what uh, Fallen calls the conceptualization of emotion. When you say, I like this, I love mm -hmm. yes. Whereas the, uh, uh, the interjections, when you say, ouch, they're what he calls the ex direct expression of emotion. Uh, so right, there is yes. no cognition in between, no, you know, no, exactly. between language yes. and the... That's right. So, yeah, it's a fascinating topic. And of course, you know, since your grammar is very formal, you, you have to... I understand what you say. You have to look at the structures. And well, yes, indeed. And it would be interesting if we came across uh, fundamentally different structures for emotion expression from non-emotion expression. But, but right. the basic fact is that we don't. Even insubordination is a derived construction that still involves a subordinate clause. Yes. In languages that have different syntax in subordinate clauses, like German, you still get that different syntax. Yeah. So. Um, mm -hmm. It's only uh, insubordinated in use, but not in, in structure. And right. grammarians, to their last breath, remain interested in structure. Right. Yes. Okay. So then, this is another question which has to do with emotion and evaluation. Do you make any differences in your grammar between emotive and evaluative categories? I'm asking this because some linguists seem to... Uh, to think that uh, that emotion and evaluation are the same thing. I don't agree with that. But no, what I do you... wouldn't uh, really agree with that either. I mean, I, I know it's been much di discussed and I've read some of the literature. You know, I don't just work as a grammarian. I also work as an evaluator right. of yeah. research proposals. Yeah, I know. And I, I, I've been trained in that. And as I would say on the basis of my experience, that um, I don't think that my work is emotional when I'm doing that. I feel very rational. Right. You look at a grant application and you evaluate it highly if it satisfies a number of rather objective uh, criteria. I mean, I do sometimes feel some emotion when I'm doing this yes, work, uh. <laughs> but that's because people <laughs> have written in an obscure way right. or have plagiarized and have copied material. But mm. that's not what you're talking uh, uh, about. Then I know you. But yes, exactly. Yeah. So I would say that in my view, evaluative language, which I then produce when I'm writing my report, um, is very different from um, emotional language. And so I see quite a big difference. So I would say, yes, evaluation is definitely possible without emotion. The question is whether emotion involves evaluation for me. And I would say yes. Yeah, I agree with Imagine you. we're in a situation um, that we experience as dangerous. We're walking in a forest and uh, we know that there are possibly snakes in that forest. Yeah. We hear a rustling in the grass, <laughs> right? Yeah. And what we do is we evaluate that very quickly maybe yeah. even subconsciously, right. as a possible danger. Dangerous. Danger even to our survival, or in any case to our health. And we then feel an emotion of fear, which would then lead us either to, probably to, to run away, right? Yeah. But then we may re-evaluate the situation and notice actually it's just a breeze of wind that has been blowing up some fallen leaves. Right. And mm -hmm. so there's no snake there mm -hmm. at all. So what's happening here is that in Klaus Scherer's theory of emotion, this is called cognitive appraisal. Yes. And so it is a kind of evaluation. Mm -hmm. You evaluate the, the, the situation in terms of likely outcomes. And then that then triggers the if the likely outcome is negative or very positive. It, um, but in the case of snakes, presumably negative. Uh, that then triggers the, the emotion. So to answer your question, Yes, there are evaluation without emotion, but emotion without evaluation? 
No, I think that that would not be possible. Good. So then we agree on this. You know, this I also I think the same. And um, then, do you think that human language is successful or or good then when when doing this job of expressing emotion? Well, I mean, as a functionalist, I'd have to say yes. I mean, it yes. must do it well because mm -hmm. if it didn't do it well, languages would have adapted mm -hmm. in such a way that um, that failure was somehow corrected. Yeah. Okay, I mean, we believe that human languages are solutions that have emerged in response to the challenge of achieving human communication. Mm -hmm. So if language didn't rise to the challenge of communicating emotions, then I think it, language would almost naturally adapt itself. It's almost Darwinian kind of process. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by the fact that languages have not developed, as far as I can tell, special tools for expressing emotions. Think of verb forms, right? We have verb forms in, in Spanish, very rich with verb forms, for different tenses, right? For different aspects, for polarity, right? In Finnish, you have positive and negative, negative verbs, right? Degrees of politeness, think of tú and usted in Spanish. Yeah. Modality, right? All the different modal verbs and um, evidentiality, elocution. But we don't have any verb forms yeah. for yeah. anger right. or fear mm -hmm. or sadness, mm -hmm. right? So another thing is we don't really adjust word order to express emotion. There's only one thing I could mention here and that is what we call exclamative word order. Okay, so I think there's a big difference between how well does he sing, with that sort of typically English inversion, and how well he sings. Right. Right? The second one is what we call an exclamative clause, and many people say this is not just a value judgment, meaning he sings well, mm -hmm. like one of those neutral assessments, but it actually expresses an emotional pleasure in the quality of his singing. Right. So, um, but... Yeah. I mean, I've been talking uh, about syntax and morphology, but there's, mustn't forget phonology, yeah. right? I and I think it's specifically in the area of prosody that emotion is most clearly signaled. Uh, mm -hmm. Prosody, I don't have to tell you, but might be useful for some of the people listening, is that part of phonology that deals with units that are bigger than the individual speech sound, bigger than the, than the phoneme. And it covers five things, right? Intonation, stress, tempo, rhythm, and pausing. Yeah. And prosody is used for many different purposes, for disambiguation, right? It's sometimes you can say something that has um, a particular morphological or syntactic structure, but then you need to use different pauses to indicate how and it all fits together. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. you, to indicate the focus of a discourse act to divide discourse into paragraphs, to indicate the presence of irony, something that right. you've written about at great length and yeah. in a very interesting way. And also, and this is perhaps most important to us here, for signaling emotions. Right. But again, notice there are no direct correlations here. People have actually carried out experiments to see how well people recognize emotions um, when presented with language but in a way that they can't understand the individual sounds. All they hear is the prosodic pattern. Yeah. And they've That's discovered true. that for that like anger and sadness, people are quite good. When it comes to other emotions, they're not so good. And one interesting thing is that for recognizing somebody else's emotions, their facial expression of course. is a better That's guide what I was going to say. Yeah. than their language. Okay, so we must be modest, I think, as linguists, if we think that language somehow reflects emotions, it's a very broken mirror. It's mm -hmm. a very, um, you know, yeah. indirect kind of reflection. So, what would I conclude? Yes, I think, to answer your question, language does a pretty good job, but in combination with many other right. factors. So that's why we need a discourse analysis of the whole situation, so not taking into account just the words that you use, but the experience facial expression Absolutely. and yeah. many and other things, yes. movements. Um, but the language is also a key element It's there. exactly. Yeah. I mean, our emotions are yeah. um, something that we try to read. And uh, reading emotions is like reading a poem, right? We, right. we, we have to mm -hmm. work hard at it. And 
it can be complicated because people also sometimes can disguise their emotions or hide sure. them completely. Sure. Yes. Okay, so now speaking about learning different languages, mm. and do we express? Do you think that we express emotions differently in different languages? Would that mean that we feel emotions differently in one language uh, than the other? You know, if you if you and if you belong to or you have you're bilingual, yes. can you feel emotions in a different way? Laura, your questions are getting more and more difficult. <laughs> it's a million dollar, million dollar question. Yeah. I mean, I think I've already made clear that for me, um, the expression of emotions is a sort of overlay on more fundamental functions of, yeah. of language. language. And so then there is really an empirical question. And then there was a question that we can research, whether that overlay is significantly different from one language to another. That's one of your questions, right? Yeah. One a ph phenomenon that occurs to me is uh, what we call idiophones. Okay, that's in, in English a word like splish splash. Right. Okay, so something like the rain fell splish splash into the puddle. Onomatopoeia. So it's a kind of onomatopoeia. It kind of yeah. imitates the sound of the falling water. Yeah. And, um, but it also conveys a sort of emotion and enjoyment of the sound, right? It right. Was, this was somebody who actually enjoys the sensation of rainfall that's mm -hmm. saying this. Now, in Japanese, I understand, not a language I know well, there are thousands of these idiophones. They're used all the time. They play a much more prominent role. And so, um, for example, if you're feeling nervous, you know, the Japanese will throw in something like doki doki, which represents the ticking of the yeah, heart, of the throbbing heart. of um, a fearful heart. Or yobo yobo, which means like a wobbly old person who's not very steady on their legs. Right. So they, but they're they're sympathetic expressions, right? They that, um, and they so they do express a kind of um, emotion. But yes, yeah, so then you ask, do we feel ex emotions differently if we belong to different cultures? Yeah, that's a tricky one. <laughs> I mean, something that comes into my mind is that in, for example, Spanish-speaking cultures. Now that I'm here, I can yeah. maybe mention that. Um, it, it may seem that people are more effusive. Right, than in the Dutch culture that I'm, right. that I'm used to, right? So, I, I, I've got it written down here, like a Facebook post, like the following. Four exclamation marks. Feliz cumple. Four exclamation marks. More exclamation marks. Espero que lo hayas pasado divino. More exclamation marks. <laughs> Te mando un beso grande. Right? Now, that's quite <laughs> normal. That's nothing unusual <laughs> on Facebook. I, yeah. I, 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 but the Dutch person is just going to write, Hartelijk gefeliciteerd, which means cordial congratulations. How about the Scottish person? Because you are a Scot. I mean, I haven't well, seen that. Well, you know, I don't think that they would be much more effusive than the Dutch. The same as but the Dutch. does this mean that Dutch people feel less affection than Spanish people? I doubt it. Why should they? You know, I mean, Dutch people are, and, and, and Scots too, are just as capable of strong emotions as anyone else. No, I think the difference lies in social norms. Right. In what's expected, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable, because, I mean, a direct translation of that Spanish into Dutch would sound Horrible. unacceptable, <laughs> ridiculous, and possibly invasive also of somebody's emotional space. Uh -huh. and, uh, so, and, of course, another thing is that actors can, I mean, actors can, can fake emotions, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking r recently about... Um, you know, when the supreme leader of North Korea, um, Kim Jong-il, died, yeah. right, people had to, were required to shed tears, right? In other words, to display an emotion that perhaps maybe some did feel, but maybe not all. No. So, I mean, the outward show of emotions, right, linguistic or otherwise, facial expressions too, is not always a good clue to the inner life. And so I would rush... <laughs> um, I would not well, rush to conclusions. I, I think, but listen, I, I speak various languages and I don't sense that the language I'm using affects what I feel deep down. Right. No, but it's also true that in different cultures you're expected to exactly. feel seeing things differently. And so maybe you, are, you get repressed because of that or I don't know, well, and then, or not. Or you, you yes. just, you know, just unleash your emotions because you can do it in this particular culture and you have to learn that you know, when you learn a foreign language. And that's why I, I like to speak about emotional bilingualism. Yes. Because you have to be emotionally bilingual in, in order to function 
in a, in a foreign uh, language. Yeah, but that's very hard, you know. Yes. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> bilingualism, let's just remember that bilingualism is the natural condition for humanity, right? Monolinguals are in the minority in the population oh, of, the, of the world. Oh, that's good to know. It's important to know, yeah. right? And what is bilingualism? Well, to me, it's the ability to communicate effectively mm -hmm. in more than one language. I mean, you, um, some people used to make incredible demands that you had to have a, a native accent, you know, that kind of thing, that you would be indistinguishable from the real thing. I mean, why? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we surely should be celebrating the multiplicity of cultures rather than trying to, uh, uh, you know, create some kind of homogeneous... Um, uh, entity that is not uh, realistic or satisfactory to the person. So, it, I mean, there are people who grew up bilingually. Like my children grew up bilingually speaking English and Dutch. Your children bilingually English and Spanish. Right. Okay, and I would say that they can communicate their emotions to complete satisfaction in either language. Yeah, They're, but maybe in a different way. That's Maybe this. in a different way, but yes. in terms of emotional satisfaction, to the same extent. Yeah. And they can also code switch, you know, they can switch yes. from one language yeah, to the other. Uh, but the thing here is that I think that when teaching uh, foreign languages, we should have this into, or take this into consideration, uh, because you may get into very embarrassing situations if you do not know how to react in that language to a particular emotional situation. You know, yes, and absolutely. So you have to I learn agree with how you. to deal. You but know, I think it's it... a big ask, as we say. You know, yeah. and um, it, people learning a foreign language at school, right? Somebody learning English in Spain, or um, somebody arriving as an immigrant who has to learn the language of the host nation yeah. at a later stage in life. You know, our emotional life is formed very early, very yeah. early, and it's tightly as. Uh, um, uh, linked to our um, our associations with with others. I mean, it's not just language. It's gesture. It's facial. It's bodily. It's I mean, there's there's so many aspects, and it's not unusual for foreign language learners to commit some kind of a faux pas, if you like, right. a, a gaffe, or to feel insecure when it comes to emotionally charged communication. Yes. Like, for example, uh, writing a letter of condolence. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a that's, a it, that's one. very tough. Yeah. Or, 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 or in business, dealing with a seriously dissatisfied customer. Right. You know, it's so hard. He, um, uh, 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 someone we both know very well, Jean-Marc de Valle, yes. has written about this, and he's looked at how English-speaking people in the UK feel about foreigners using swear words. Yes. Okay. Sure. Many English people in the UK and uh, maybe other people in, in other countries of the UK feel that there's something unusual or not quite right about foreigners using swear words. Yeah, they can use them, but if you're a foreigner... Mm, exactly. You're kind of... No. Yeah, you're supposed to sort of speak clean, Look down you know? I don't know yes. why that is. And, um, but, but, but what his work does show, and I think it's interesting, is that the more contacts you have in society, and, and the more varied your contacts are, the better you will handle this notion of emotional um, yes. bilingualism. Yeah. So, uh, but to try to create emotional bilingualism in a school, in somewhere in, in, in Spain, is, yes. uh, you know, with respect to English, seems to me almost impossible. <laughs> Difficult. But yeah. yes, if you, if you immigrate to a country. Yeah. Let, let me just go back yeah. to this thing about I love you, okay? <laughs> um, what I absolutely do not believe is that the grammatical form of emotions um, affect how people feel. I, I, I made a little list here on this piece of paper. In Scottish Gaelic, you can also say, I love you, but then you say, Hagra akam orst, which means, is love at me on you? Oh. Right? In That's... Swiss German, you say, ich gern, which means, I have you willingly. Huh? And that means I love you. That means I love you. In Dutch, is ich hau van jou which means I hold from you. So there's no word. In that. Afrikaans, it's, it's uh, ex lief for jou, which means I am sweet for you. I, now, like, that. I like that one. Okay, you like that one. But <laughs> don't tell me, and I'm just not, never going to believe it, language determines how you feel when you're in love. No. All these people feel exactly the same thing, but, they, but the, the language is, expresses it differently. So... I think that we have to be extremely cautious about saying that um, 
language affects the inner life. Language is a tool. It's something that they use like a car in order to, uh, to move to our destination. It's like um, a hammer that we use to knock in a nail, right? Mm. And just as that hammer doesn't affect our inner life and our car doesn't affect our inner life, perhaps for some people, um, <laughs> uh, our language doesn't either. Well, it's, um, you know, language in some ways determines uh, the way you not only feel, but the way you act sometimes, because, you know, mm, well, this is the uh, Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. I mm -hmm. mean, the, yes. the, like, uh, you know, language determines the world, or the world affects the language, or what do mean? I think there's a little bit of both. I think that, yes. I, I mean, it, it, it would be unusual. Yeah. Since language and, uh, is something we use all the time, it would be unusual if our thinking wasn't... Uh, influenced by, by the that. language you yes, use. Yes, right. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's known that uh, when German people are asked to draw a bridge, and German has the word for bridge in the feminine, right, they will tend to draw a bridge that has, um, at least in stereotypical terms, more feminine shape uh -huh. than in Spanish, for example, where puente is it's masculine. masculine yes. And then Spanish people will tend to draw the bridge with more um, uh, rectangular, masculine, uh, yeah. a masculine kind of form. So yeah. that may well be some sort of influence. Yeah. But the idea that your emotional inner life is affected by your language, no. I find that hard to swallow. No, and then also to say that the Dutch are colder than the Spanish. Oh, yes, no. I mean, that kind of thing. But that's yes. a generalization. Yeah. Can very quickly become do, um, yeah. uh, xenophobic and mm, the like, and good. I don't like that kind of talk. We are linguists and we should be objective. No, I don't like that kind of talk at all. No, yeah. So finally, this is another million dollar question. So right. do, do you believe, as some authors do, that there is a connection between the linguistic expression of emotion and emotional intelligence because, well, emotional intelligence is a construct that is very difficult to define, yes. has been defined by Goldman and mm -hmm. other authors, um, but it, it's basically about being empathetic. Mm -hmm. and, and we're interested in this because in our project we, we're not only dealing with linguistics but also with some, you know, uh, psychology and social linguistics. It has to do with... Uh, uh, emotions at work, at mm -hmm. the workplace. Yes. Uh, and so it seems that it's better if you have emotional intelligence at the workplace and you know how to express, you know, your feelings or in general, and you're going to be, if you do know that, you're going to be more successful or, or you will have more char the characteristics of a leader, for instance. Or, so what do you think? Well, that makes incredibly good sense to me. I, I, I'm sure that, that empathy um, is a very useful uh, property or characteristic for, for leaders. A, a, a leader who understands also not only um, his or her own perspective, but also that of the people that um, she's leading, will be more effective. And that must also have repercussions for the language that they use, but of course on many other aspects of their behavior too, right? How they present mm -hmm. themselves, how they... Um, uh, organize the working life of people and, and, and so on. But, well, I mean, to answer your question, I don't know the answer, of course. This is now very far from my own uh, specialism. But I mean, it's clear to me that there's room for research here. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, business communication manuals are full of examples of how to formulate bad news messages. Yes. Particularly the bad news messages, like you have to tell somebody that they're not going to get a raise mm -hmm. or that... Um, their vacations are being cut or, or, or whatever, and there have been many bad news messages in business recently, yes. after all. Anyway, uh, but okay. if people can communicate in ways that respect the emotional sensitivity of the recipient, so much the better. So, I mean, what linguists could do, particularly discourse analysts, would be to look at the uh, examples of sensitive messages and non-sensitive messages, and then try to determine, just using the tools of discourse analysis, whether there are properties at any level, from the overall text structure down to the individual choice of words, that, um, that would systematically characterize, you know, empathetic communication. Yeah. I, I, maybe that work's been done. You can tell me. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, indeed. Uh, you know, there's this book by Dulek and Fielding. Uh, yes. It's uh, Principles of Business Communication. Yes. And it was, I mean, for me, it was interesting to see 
that these people who were mainly psychologists but mm -hmm. devoted to business, uh, you know, uh, affairs, that they divided uh, their the whole work, you know, in what they call sensitive messages and non-sensitive messages. And, and the whole aim of the, that book is to teach people how to deliver sensitive messages mm. or non-sensitive messages and what type of style, you know, even right. though they didn't yes. get into the yes. structures, you know, because they are not linguists. No. But, you know, their main classification was based on emotions, you know, on right. because a sensitive message is the one that would trigger some kind of emotion in the hearer exactly. or, or receiver. Yes. Yes. Whereas the non-sensitive one is the one that wouldn't trigger any special kind of emotion, so they are the easier ones, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I thought it was interesting that in the business world that people were thinking of emotions as well and, uh, and how they should be dealt with by using language, you know, in the messages that they were... So, um, uh, yes, absolutely, um, and uh, I, I think my only recommendation would be to look at the language also in the broader context, the broader context. and, and mm -hmm. even, uh, for example, the timing of a message may be important. Okay. There are many other things, but linguistics and also our, our functional discourse grammar has, a, has a really got a whole toolbox of uh, techniques, quantitative and qualitative, and, and, and these could be used to, to, analyze. to analyze it and to go beyond just this rather vague notion of style yes. towards some kind of more analytic uh, specificity. True. Yeah. Okay, so we've come to the end of the interview. So thank you very much, Lachlan, well, for, for coming again. It was a great pleasure, again. of course. It was a great pleasure to have you here and uh, to listen to your knowledgeable, uh, you know, expertise. And, and so we're very happy that uh, you came to visit. And so this is the end of the interview and see you in the next module. Goodbye.